Hello, I'm Sherry Lewis. Welcome to Heart to Heart Women's Bible Study. We are in session five or our fifth week of our study of No Other Gods by Kelly Minter. We have learned to identify potential false gods or idols or functional gods as we've called them. Um, we've learned to identify things that draw us to false gods and idols. Last week we learned about the role of deception and lies and intimidation that can call us, cause us to fall for idols. This week we're going to learn about the folly of creating false gods out of people, to depend on people to take the place of God or to fill that deep need in our heart that only God can fill. And when we depend on people for that, we develop um, unhealthy relationships and heartbreak and devastation is left behind us um, kind of like a trail that a tornado leaves. But there is a better way. We have focused on the story of Rachel and Leah and there are so many points that we can learn from them. So we will do a lot of reading, a lot of Bible reading today as I bring out these points. And if you'll just bear with me for the next few minutes, I believe that God has something to say to our hearts and help us apply to our lives and to teach us so that our pursuit of Him is pure and um, passionate like never before and, and that we can get rid of the, the hindrances, the things that keep us from drawing closer to God. I pray that this is eye-opening to you. As we're using the story of Rachel and Leah, um, one of the points that I want to make is some of the idols that we have in our lives or the things that we use to replace God, they're not always evil things. It's, it's not what we imagine at the very, you know, the very first thought of an idol would be of course a graven image or a statue, or we might think of addictions or, um, you know, behaviors such as that but not realizing that even in this story we can see that even people or even good things can become idols because it's all in our focus. It's all in the attitude of our hearts that can make something an idol or not. So when our eyes are open to this, then we can remove that and have balance and have spiritual health in our lives. Um, when we look to people as the ultimate source to meet our needs, everyone loses. But when Jesus is my ultimate love, when he is first, then I'm able to love everyone else around me more wholly. W-H-O-L-L-Y, in a whole way. When we are complete in Christ, then we don't seek for people to complete us, and then we can have healthier relationships. Well, let's move on to Genesis chapter 29, starting with verse 16. And I thought it would be interesting... Um, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation um, just because of the flow of the story. The concepts are exactly the same and in a deep study I typically prefer a word-for-word -word translation but to get to the gist of the story I thought that the flow was better um, but you are welcome to also check this out in in your favorite translation. But starting with verse 16 it says now Laban had two daughters the older daughter was Leah and the younger one was Rachel there was no sparkle in Leah's eyes, or some translations say that she had weak eyes or she had dull eyes, or even some say she has soft eyes. But Rachel had a beautiful figure and a lovely face. So I can imagine the two girls may have been compared all their lives. And because we have a tendency to view the outward appearance as being so important, Rachel may have been put on this pedestal and Leah made to feel unloved, unwanted, unchosen when she may have had spectacular gifts that God had given her that were squelched because of the comparison to Rachel's outward beauty. But that's another story in and of itself. Now we know that Jacob had been working for his uncle Laban. And at verse 18 it says, since Jacob was in love with Rachel, he told her father, I will work for you for seven years if you'll give me Rachel, your younger daughter is my wife. Agreed, Laban replied. So Laban made a deal with Rachel, and I mean with Rachel, with Jacob, and promised his daughter Rachel to him if he worked for seven years. Verse 20, so Jacob worked seven years to pay for Rachel, but his love for her was so strong that it seemed to him but a few days. 
Finally, the time came for him to marry her. I have fulfilled my agreement, Jacob said to Laban. Now give me my wife so I can sleep with her. So Laban invited everyone in the neighborhood and prepared a wedding feast. But that night when it was dark, Laban took Leah to Jacob, not Rachel. And he slept with her. But when Jacob woke up in the morning, it was Leah. Now it's hard for me to understand how that could have happened, how he was tricked into marrying the wrong sister and not even noticed it. But that's what happened. You know, the culture back then was so different. So he wakes up, find out he's married the wrong girl. And he was horrified. What have you done to me, Jacob raged at Laban. I worked seven years for Rachel. Why have you tricked me? Well, it is not our custom here to marry off a younger daughter ahead of the older daughter, which he could have told him that ahead of time. But anyway, I'm thinking that maybe Laban was thinking, well, this is the only way that Leah's ever going to get a guy is through trickery and deceit. But verse 27, but wait until the bridal week is over and then I will give you Rachel too, provided you promise to work another seven years for her. So Jacob agreed to seven more years. A week after Jacob had married Leah, then Laban gave him Rachel too. So there it was set up. Rachel had Jacob's love. Leah was trapped in a situation where she would never receive the love that she longed for. She would always be the one that was second best, the one that was not chosen. And this situation trapped her in that mentality. So Jacob slept with Rachel too, verse 30, and he loved her much more than Leah. He then stayed and worked for Laban an additional seven years. So this is how it all started. And we're going to see throughout this that um, Rachel and Leah were in, were in constant competition with each other and there was constant comparison. And you will also see that each one wanted what the other had. And we have a tendency sometimes, uh, particularly with social media, but we see this in the culture around us, that when we see the life of someone else, we see their the surface, we see the best, we see what I call sometimes the highlight reel or the airbrushed images, just the very best features that they want you to see. And then we compare it to our blooper reel or to our struggles and think, you know, if I really had what this person had, then I would be happy. And this is what Leah is feeling right now. She thought, if I could just have the love of Jacob like Rachel does, if I could have Rachel's beauty and the love that she has, then I will be happy too. And we're going to see that this is not what happened. In verse 31, it says, when the Lord saw, and before I move on even further, understand that little old Leah, little old seemingly unimportant Leah, was not unobserved, not unnoticed by God at all. God saw, God saw that she was unloved, but God had a plan for her. In this, she saw that she was not loved by Jacob and God saw that. But instead of God taking Jacob and twisting his heart and making him love her, which God could have done, God had a better plan for her. He opened up her womb, it says and enabled her to have children. And skipping on way ahead, generations on down the line, if we go to the book of Matthew and we see the lineage of Jesus, it says Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac was the father of Jacob, Jacob was the father of Judah, and Judah was the son of Leah. And you know what, I think I just said that backwards. Yeah, no, I said that right. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah. And Leah was the mother. So God had a very, very important plan for her. When she felt unloved and unchosen, God looked at Leah and said, but I choose you. You are the one I choose to be the mother in the line of the Messiah who would come to save the world. So she totally had a distorted view of who she is. But let's go back to the story. We read in um, the next several verses, I won't read all of them, but Leah had four sons in a row. With the first three sons, with each one, she said, Surely the Lord has noticed my misery, and now my husband will love me. The Lord heard I was in love, unloved and gave me another son. And then the next one, Surely my husband will feel affection for me. But it wasn't until the fourth son, when Judah was born, where Leah said, now I will praise the Lord. So for a moment, 
Leah had that wholeness. They had, she had that fulfillment. She had that satisfaction in God and was able to praise him. She never got Jacob's love, but she knew she was blessed by God. Now, here's where it, this just blows my mind. Because I want you to see the first few words in chapter 30, verse 1. It says, when Rachel saw, again, someone seeing. <coughs> I don't think Rachel realized that she was missing something until she saw what her sister had. She had Jacob's love. She had the looks. She had that fulfillment. But guess what? She wasn't happy. Leah thought that if she had what Rachel had, that she would be happy. But she didn't know that Rachel was unhappy. Rachel saw that she wasn't having children. And she pleaded. She was very jealous of her sister, as Scripture says. She pleaded with Jacob, give me children or I'll die. Now that doesn't sound like a very happy person to me. While Leah's God, or Leah's idol, was Jacob, Rachel's was the idea of having children. So here's what Rachel did. Rachel said, I'm going to take matters in my own hands. Since God is not doing this, I am going to fix this on my own. And that's a lot of times, that's, that's what false gods, that's what idol worship is. Instead of allowing God to meet those deep needs in our hearts, we seek it out for ourselves and we try to make it happen for ourselves. So she gives her maid to Jacob to sleep with him. And instead of, oh joy, there's a son, she says, I have wrestled hard with my sister and I have won. So to her, it was a great big competition. It was a matter of one upping her sister. Then she felt like, okay, now I've got more than my sister and now I can be happy. Then she did it again. And um, it became pregnant again and said, I've struggled hard with my sister and I'm winning. And that's what it says in verse eight. But I want you to compare two women here. Hannah is one that we had talked about, um, you know, in previous weeks. When Hannah was unfulfilled, and she did not have a child, and she was in agony, she went straight to God. She went to the temple and she just cried out to God. She poured her heart out with all that's in him, in her. <laughs> and God gave her Samuel. But Rachel's reaction was totally different. She says, I will take matters in my own hands. Kind of like Sarah did, if you also remember that in the story. And, um, and she thought that this would make her feel better. So it became a competition. And when Leah saw, again, this moving down um, in verse 9, when Leah realized that she wasn't getting pregnant anymore, she didn't just suddenly wake up one day and say, oh, I'm not having any more children. It was when she saw that Leah's maid had two children. I mean, Rachel's maid had two children and Rachel was getting all the attention. But all of a sudden, Leah started wanting children again. So copycatter Leah had to take her maid, give her to Jacob so that she could have sons too. And um, her reaction was similar. And that, you know, now she felt like, okay, now I have one over my sister. So this constant competition, this constant looking of what the other had, and then becoming discontented with themselves. Part of their idolship or idol worship was not just Jacob and wanting to have children. It was also one upping the sister to feel like they were of value and they were worthwhile if they had something up on the other child. I mean, the other sister. I said child because of the child, um, the bearing story, part of the story. But I want you to look in chapter 30, verse 14. I'm going to read this part of the story. And the first son, Reuben, now this had to have been several years later because Reuben, I mean, this is, you know, Leah's had four children and each of the maids have, there are four children there, more children there. So Reuben had to have been old enough to be tending the field at this point. And in verse 14, one day during the wheat harvest, Reuben found some mandrakes growing in a field and brought them to his mother Leah. Rachel begged Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. This reveals a lot, but Leah angrily replied, wasn't it enough that you stole my husband and now you will steal my son's mandrakes too? Now this is more than just a piece of fruit. Um, The continuation of the story reveals much of the of the ugly jealousy and what 
lust and greed and the desires that are within us as it says in James 4 that it's desires within us that can lead to these ugly emotions that we're seeing come to pass. A mandrake is a plant that is supposedly um, considered useful in improving fertility. So what Lee was really angry about, it wasn't a matter of you're going to eat a piece of fruit that my son gave me. It wasn't that at all. What she was basically saying is, listen, Rachel, you have the one thing I want. The one thing, the love of Jacob, the one thing I will never have. And now you're wanting the one only thing that I have. All I have, the only thing I have of value is to be able to bear children for Jacob. It's my fertility. That's the one thing I value. And you want that too? It's my only ace in the hole. The only thing I have to make Jacob want me. And basically she was also saying, not only will he not love me, but this is the only thing I have that makes him need me and that would make him want me. And what I see here is a pattern where a lot of women in particular, but you know, it's the human nature thing that longs to be wanted and loved so much that we're willing to settle for working for sloppy seconds or settling for um, codependency, which is, it's not love at all. Having to work hard to earn someone's affection is never really love. It's not love at all. But Leah was so desperate that she was willing to trade this so she could have one more night with Jacob. One more opportunity, even though, it, this is just so sad to me because even though it was never going to be what she wanted, it was all she felt she could hope for. And, um, that evening as Jacob was coming home from the fields, oh, wait a minute, in verse, um, in verse 15, after Leah had replied, now you want my son's mandrakes too, Rachel answered, well, I will let Jacob sleep with you tonight if you give me some of the mandrakes. So she's making a very sad bargain here. So that evening as Jacob was coming home from the fields, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come and sleep with me tonight because I have paid for you with some mandrakes that my son found. And so he slept with her and that's what she had to do to get affection. And there are people who are willing to settle for that. And what they end up with, instead of getting the love and the fulfillment that they're looking for, they find themselves in a pit of brokenness, unfulfillment, loneliness, very often abuse or manipulation, um, and disappointment. And that's all that can come out of that. When you're trying to fill that need with something inferior, something that won't satisfy, you're always going to be left wanting more. When you think, I'll just be happy if I get the thing I want, the thing will never satisfy. It's kind of like an addiction. When you do an action or um, take in a substance and it causes pleasure sensors in your brain to trigger, then it makes you want more. You want that feeling again. And, but it's, it, you can never be satisfied with the same amount. You always crave more. It always has to take more to get that high again. And this is similar to what Leah and Rachel were going through is it was, it was a type of addiction where they kept wanting more. And anytime that we seek for fulfillment in a thing, a material or a person, it's always going to take more to give us that high again, but it's never going to be lasting and never going to be fulfilling. In um, John chapter four, verse 10, Jesus dealt with this with the woman at the well. And you're probably familiar with this story. But in verse 10, Jesus replied to this woman. He had asked her to get him some water. And she said, if, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you were speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. And down in verse 13, Jesus replied, and anyone who drinks this water, talking about the water from the well, will be thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. And so that's one of the most important points here is that the pitiful situations between Leah and Rachel, always trying to one up the other and trying to find the fulfillment in what the other person has in what they see someone else has. And we sometimes do that too, whether it's in social media or um, in culture, on the TV and entertainment, we look around and we see things that we think will fulfill us. 
And it's just like drinking that water that we'll just have to drink again and again, and we'll be thirsty again soon. But the only thing that will fulfill is the living water of Jesus Christ. He is the only one that can meet that deep longing. And you've heard this before, but the, the God-shaped hole in our hearts. God is the only one who can fulfill that hole. God can fill those holes in that need so that we're satisfied. So how do we get out of this? And I really like the very last day of our study when um, James actually explains what we need to do. You see, God's grace really comes into its own when we humble ourselves before God. And in James chapter 4, and starting with verse 6, it says, And he gives grace generally. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So, step one, humble yourself before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. It starts by humbling ourselves before God. You know, God, I have looked for fulfillment in other things. I have resisted you when you are the very one that I need. I have looked to what others have and, and have longed for it. I've been jealous. I have had greed or, or whatever the case may be. And admit that. Confess that to God. And let him know that you understand and you recognize that he is all that you need. And in verse 8, it says, come close to God and God will come close to you. Or draw near to God and he will draw near to you. He's right there waiting for you to do that. But he will hold his hands as long as you keep trying to fix it in yourself. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. So wash your hands. Purify yourself of the sin of the things that you are seeking after that are not pleasing to God. And then let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. He's not saying it, it's wrong to be happy or joyful. He's just saying it, there is a season, a time to mourn for your sin. You should be sorrowful for the sin. And then bring it before the Lord. Humble yourself before the Lord as you're sorry for your sins. Truly, deeply sorry. And then humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Now the story concludes where Rachel is finally given a son. God saw Rachel. And I think those words God saw are some of the most beautiful words. And it wasn't that God had forgotten and then suddenly went, whoa, Rachel. No, it was the time for God to act. That's what it means when, we, when it says that he remembered. It was time to move on Rachel's behalf and she bore a son Joseph and she said now God has removed my disgrace before she tried to remove her own disgrace but it wasn't until she gave it to God and she realized that only God could do it only God can remove our disgrace and remove the the thing the jealousy the thing inside of us that causes us to look to idols instead of to God, because only God can fulfill. Unfortunately, when, when Rachel gave birth to her second son, Benjamin, that is when um, she died in childbirth. And it was interesting that the very thing that she thought would fulfill her, the only thing she thought she really wanted, was the thing which she said, give me ch children or I will die. It was when she had her second child that she died and sometimes we can be we can have it so misplaced so misunderstood what will really make us happy and be fulfilled but understand from these that it was God it was God who fulfilled them and God who can fulfill us so let's humble ourselves before the Lord let's learn from the story of Rachel and Leah I encourage you to read the story again for yourself and and notice are there things in in me, in my heart, as I look at other people, as, as I look at screens, so to speak, as we talked about in our, in our groups, how screens bring the, the thoughts of the world into, you know, into easy access for us to constantly view and influence our mind. Are we allowing those things to deceive us and to make us think that's what we need to be happy? Are we looking to a person, another person, to fulfill a need that only God can? Um, if you are, your expectations will never be met. And I also want to speak to wives 
who are putting that expectation on your husbands, an expectation that he will never meet, and then you start to build a resentment toward him because he's not meeting that need. Or single women, are you expecting or hoping for a relationship that will meet that need? I mean, it's normal as a human to desire that relationship. God put that desire in us. But is your expectation reasonable? Is it God-pleasing? But if you seek God first, seek Him with all your heart. In Matthew 6, seek God first, and then all these things will be added unto you. Put it in focus, and then it will fall into its perfect balance. Well, I think I've repeated the, the point several times, but I really hope you got this. And um, we're moving on to session six. A lot more to study, a lot more to learn. And I'm just proud of you for sticking it out. Just keep on going. And if you've taken some time where um, maybe you've gotten a little behind, no worries. Just jump on where we are. Pick up where we are. You're welcome anytime to come and go as you need. And I just pray that you will let God bless you through this. Draw close to him and he will draw close to you. Have a blessed day.